Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and uh, I really value being here during uh, the entire sort of uh, discussion because a lot of the themes I uh, will discuss tonight and I'll discuss in my book have been already in part reviewed, anticipated, and uh, uh, enlarged. So uh, my job is much easier as a result of uh, what, what came before me. And uh, I want to start, as um, Zelibotti was saying, I would start from uh, the book I wrote uh, 10 years ago with Raghu Rajan, uh, with a very sexy title, Saving Capitalists from the Capitalists. That book emerged from uh, our research on financial development and our question of why uh, the good institutions, what we thought were relatively good institutions that were prevailing in the United States, were so rare around the world. And we came to a conclusion that uh, was maybe obvious for a lot of people, was le less obvious for two Chicago economists to say, um, markets are not a spontaneous creation. They need a institutional infrastructure. And ironically, the institutional infrastructure that leads to the good function of a market is the ultimate public good. Everybody benefits from having a level playing field of having markets more competitive, but nobody benefits enough to lobby for it. In a sense, the weakest lobby is the lobby for markets, uh, especially competitive markets that don't favor sort of uh, one uh, provider over the others. And from this sort of a very pessimistic view about uh, the uh, existence and diffusion of markets, we conclude that book with a, a, a hope, a hope that was also the result of uh, sort of uh, the 1990s that saw a spread of uh, um, competition and, and better markets throughout the world. And our idea was that uh, uh, while government cannot be trusted to do the right thing because they tend to be captured, uh, competition in the market for goods and services and in financial markets are pushing governments to uh, adopt quite reluctantly, if you want, more efficient rules, uh, rules that create uh, better markets because that makes sort of uh, local agents more competitive in the global marketplace. And so what uh, cannot be trusted uh, uh, for the government to do in general, it can as a result of this global competition. And Nine years went by, and a major financial crisis, but not only a financial crisis, also, in my view, was the realization that at least for my own country, Italy, this rule did not apply. And uh, while certainly, if you are Singapore, uh, Singapore is not a democracy, but is a country with extremely good uh, rule of law and institutions. Why? Because you're so small that if you make a mistake, you are literally wiped out from the face of the of the world. So uh, competition really works well on keeping Singapore institution on their toes. Uh, this cannot be said even for Italy, uh, a country that, after all, is not that big, uh, but that in the last 10 or 15 years was able to uh, live with terrible institutions and actually institutions getting worse as a result of globalization, because one of the things that uh, took place in the last 20 or, or, or years or so is that most successful entrepreneurs in Italy move out of the competitive sectors that were threatened by global competition, move into sort of uh, regulated public utilities uh, where you make money by being politically connected, and that was their major social comparative advantage. And so as a result of that, Actually, the Italian government and the Italian institutions became worse rather than better. But more importantly was the realization that some of the problems that Italy encountered were slowly capturing also the United States. And you know, one of the few advantages of going back and forth between two walls is that you kind of see earlier something that you have seen before. And some of the signs that I saw uh, becoming more acute during the financial crisis, but were predates by far the financial crisis, is that the United States um, are moving in the wrong direction. As I said, they 
they, they are becoming sort of more similar to Italy and not in the good food and wine, that would be a great thing, but in the bad things that, that Italy unfortunately represents. And, uh, and I apologize uh, to, for my Italian fellows because I do use, it's true, uh, Italy as a sort of a negative benchmark. Part of it is because it is true, but part of it is because if you have a foreign accent, it's not easy to criticize a country where you have been adopted uh, unless you sort of put your country of origin first on the line. And, and I think that, uh, that that's part of uh, what I do with the book. But so the, the, the thing that really pushed me to, to write a book is in, in the sort of uh, March of uh, 2009, in the worst moment of the financial crisis, there were two young entrepreneurs who approached me uh, because they had an idea on how to start a business that was trying to bypass the banking sector to land. And the idea was intriguing enough that I spent some time sort of talking to them. And then it occurred to me the question of sort of why did they come to me? Uh, they were not my own students. Um, I'm not even the most famous professor of entrepreneurship in Chicago, let alone in the country. Uh, so why on earth they came to me? And so I asked them, and very sort of openly, they said, oh, because uh, you are so um, vocal in the public arena that we thought you could be a useful advocate uh, for us to get some of the top money. And I was sort of uh, quite sad because number one meant that I wasn't clear enough in my writing that uh, that was against my principle. But most importantly, because here there are some young entrepreneurs that have a lobbying plan even before they have a business plan. <laughs> That's really the end of the entrepreneurial spirit of America. There is something deeply wrong that is taking place. And so I started to ask myself, first of all, why this happen in the United States today? What, what is going wrong? Why the benchmark that in the book of 2003 we thought was the benchmark for other countries to follow has deteriorated so far? And you know, certainly uh, recent events like uh, Citizen United does, don't help in that direction. But the problem is, is much, much deeper. Um, and as a lot of uh, uh, causal uh, roots, one of which is, as some of uh, the speakers today pointed out, the involvement in the state in every sector that makes it extremely profitable to capture the states in order to have advantages. But I think that uh, there are other aspects which are uh, not to be ignored. In a sense, uh, lobbying is part of freedom and is protected by the US Constitution. However, I think that uh, free marketeers like me have been way too um, sort of uh, nice and tolerant vis-a-vis -vis lobbying because they always saw in lobbying a way to get uh, the government off your back. And you know, if you are a libertarian, this is a, a good thing. And, and so if you see its lobbying as protecting yourself against an overly intrusive government, the way sort of uh, Gilles sees it being in France, where you have an extremely intrusive government, a little bit more efficient than the Italian one, but at least uh, uh, equally intrusive, um, then sort of uh, fight, this fight is a good fight. And so uh, for a long time, uh, lobbying was seen as this. And I think that what we are missing is that now lobbying has changed. And from being a fight of get the government off your back is how to get the government in your pocket. And this has been very profitable, uh, so profitable that I like to say that there is no legal and probably not even illegal activity that is so profitable as sort of lobbying. Uh, I'm not an expert in cocaine dealing, but I think that even cocaine dealing probably does not have the kind of return that you have to lobby. And uh, you know, um, a, a, an economist, uh, actually it was a lawyer turned into economist, uh, very insightful that for some reason I've not received the, the full uh, uh, level of appreciation, Gordon Tallock, uh, said many, many years ago, uh, with the surprise of most uh, normal people, that uh, the problem is that there was too little money in politics. And uh, now, 30 years after he spoke, 
uh, the amount of money in politics increased dramatically. But in spite of that, I think his argument is correct. Uh, you know, if you do a back of the envelope calculation, with the two billion it takes to run a, a uh, overall on both sides the presidential campaign and another billion for Congress with three billion, uh, you get the right to decide over all the government budget uh, for at least two years. Then there is another sort of a election. So if you think about uh, with how little money can control so much money, the surprise is why there is so little money in politics. And I think that Gordon Tallock is absolutely right. And unfortunately, what we've seen over the years is that firms have caught up to this idea. They've realized that there is a lot of money to be made in lobbying, and uh, they have increased dramatically this uh, amount to the extent that now I think has become a problem. And one sign of this is the wealth around Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a place that doesn't produce anything good. Uh, and this is, there is nothing that can be sold producing Washington, basically. In spite of that, seven of the 10 uh, wealthiest counties in the United States are in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, in the 70s, Washington, D.C., I'm told, I wasn't there, was a pretty boring town with no activities and no sort of a good opera, good, good restaurant. Today, rivals New York for entertainment and, and restaurants and uh, all the amenities that are associated with wealth. All this wealth is not really produced, is sort of sucked to Washington. Uh, I don't know whether you remember sort of uh, Ross Perot, the giant sucking sound, uh, was supposed to be sort of a, a Mexico, but in fact is, is Washington attracting all uh, the money in there and, and destroying it. And I think that uh, the increase income inequality that Alan has shown earlier today uh, contributes also to uh, the power of, uh, of lobbying and to the ability of lobbies to enroll more and more intellectual to their uh, services. Uh, we wonder why uh, the intellectual debate in Washington has become so acrimonious and so divided. And the answer is because I think most people are higher help. And like all higher help, they are not really sort of free to disagree on a, on a, on a platform or a party line. And uh, they sort of uh, become even more extremists in this party line, uh, trying to sort of fight against each other. But uh, I don't know whether Alan will agree with that, but my view is that much of this arguing is, in fact, on side issues. Because when it comes to real important decision, there is a very solid bipartisan majority in Congress. When it comes to uh, lobbying and helping sort of business, uh, you have both sides of uh, uh, the political spectrum quite supportive in that direction. In fact, um, um, we're talking about uh, the role play by uh, Berlusconi in Italy. I think there is only one sort of uh, benefit of Berlusconi, is to have made so crystal clear how dangerous that path is. Because I claim that Berlusconi is nothing but a vertically integrated version of the US Congress. Uh, <laughs> Berlusconi sort of uh, owns a party and uh, owns the people who run for office. And generally, sort of uh, uh, when uh, they're not his former mistress, his uh, ministers are sort of uh, his former employees. And uh, so they enhance his sort of interest directly. In the United States, uh, most uh, sort of uh, Secretary of State are past employees and future employees of a few firms. And when they are there, they generally sort of uh, announce the interest of those few firms. So there is a benefit, there is a bit of competition, and there is one step removed that they are not like uh, current employees at the same time. But the substance is not that different. And when you see where this is leading, then you get sort of uh, worried. And so the first question I, I ask myself is, why historically the United States was different? Why in the United States there was 
a form of capitalism that was quite appealing. One of the things that really made me think is that most Italian economists who went to the United States and either stayed there or came back, and there are a lot of them, most of them, I am an, actually an exception to that, went there as extreme leftists. And when I say leftists, I don't mean Democrats. I mean sort of uh, to the left of the then Communist Party. In the United States, you need the GPS to actually find how leftists they were. And uh, inevitably, all of them came back as free marketeers. And uh, why is that the case? And in part is because, of course, by studying economics, they saw the light. But in part of it was actually leaving in the United States, they realized that some institution, in particular competition, it is a better protector of sort of uh, ordinary people than heavy regulation that they found in Italy. And so I think that uh, the United States traditionally had been different. And my question is why they had been different. And uh, I sort of pinpoint to a combination of lucky factors that emerged historically and clearly sort of uh, lasted until the beginning of the 80s that uh, uh, contributed to a stability of not only the US capitalist system, but also the US democracy, in a sense, almost all Western democracies. Because we have to start from this, the following fact. There is a tension between a capitalist society and a democratic society. In a capitalist society, you reward merit, and you tend to lead to income inequality. In a democ democracy, income inequality is not particularly appreciated. Uh, Switzerland is an example of that with a referendum coming up. And people don't like to earn less than others. And in particular, uh, in, a, in a sort of unequal society, the majority of people earn less than the top. And uh, the majority of people want to redistribute. So there is a natural tendency toward redistribution in one way or another from the few to the many in a democracy. And the United States somehow got this sort of equilibrium for a long time right. They were not too sort of uh, massive into the redistributional element of, uh, of this democratic society. On the other hand, they had a very strong democracy, I would say popular democracy, that put a limit to the concentrated power. Um, for those of you who are not sort of uh, familiar with US history, there was a period that, in my view, is very important uh, of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, where the US system went through a major industrialization, where sort of uh, the large industrial companies emerged, and where sort of the democracy fought back with a popular movement. There was even a party called People's Party that, unlike most sort of a popular movement in uh, Europe, and no Marxist component to it, but was to readdress the, po the power balance between ordinary people and large corporations. And while the People's Party never won a major election, many of its ideas trickled down and were finally incorporated into law during the progressive era legislation, partly by a, a president that was actually a Republican president, Theodore Roosevelt. And if you want to get a sense of how different the American democracy was and is, imagine sort of the beginning of the 20th century, the American democracy took on the largest monopolies of all the time, Rockefeller, who, by the way, donated the money for the University of Chicago, and sort of, uh, and won. So can you imagine in any of sort of European countries uh, the richest man being attacked on a ground of antitrust and sort of uh, that fight being won? I think that, it, in my view, is unprecedented even today. Uh, I think that speaks very highly of what the American democracy has been throughout. And I think that uh, uh, the American exceptionalism of difference was also rooted in a very strong sense of uh, uh, belief, belief in, in market and in sort of uh, social mobility. 
Uh, Alan this morning has shown something that unfortunately is true, that in recent years the US system has failed miserably in terms of promoted social mobility. However, historically, I don't think that was the case. And historically, there was a strong rhetoric that if I cannot succeed myself, uh, my children would be able to. And uh, in the words of, uh, of President Lincoln, uh, anybody can be in my role, of course his role as president, uh, in the future generation. So there is that, that sense of uh, not only the uh, ability to, write, to rise, but also the right to rise. Uh, when, when Lincoln was attacked because he was saying, you know, in slavery in the South, actually uh, African American were better off than uh, in the North working as employees, etc. He was saying no, because uh, slavery is immoral, and is immoral because prevent the right to rise, which was a fundamental value of the American democracy, a uh, value that seemed to be to manifesting itself in the period after World War II. And I think I want to spend a little bit of time explaining what was so special during that time, because it explains not only why we have problems in the United States today, but why in the entire Western world we have problems. And I think the, the answer is very simple. If you go back at the end of World War II, the United States not only emerged as the winning country, but emerged as the best industrial economy, em, uh, emerged as the country with the best educational system, with the vast majority of people with a high school degree, at a time where many countries were still fighting with illiteracy, you had 43% of the workforce with a high school degree. And basically, one of the few countries where rule of law was respected and property was respected. So at that time, if you had a business idea, you were afraid to sort of develop, uh, not to mention Italy, but even in France. Uh, and uh, you know, the United States appears as probably the only safe place to, to, to do it. Uh, both from an institutional point of view and also from a point of view of having an educated workforce. As a result of this, and this is where I think I disagree slightly with Alan, as a result of this, the high school graduate in the United States enjoy a rent. Why? Because in the world there were scarce factor. Where do you find educated workforce in a country that respects the rule of law uh, not very many places around the world. So as a result, uh, the uh, high school graduates earn a rent, and that rent is the rent that allow that generation to uh, buy a house, send their kids to college, and feel so much better uh, of their future and their children's future. Now, what happened in the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years is not so much the fault of the United States, even if Alan was, was absolutely right that the quality of education, even everything has, has gone down, and I'm gonna come back on this. But the most important thing is that the rest of the world has actually imitated the United States, the good things of the United States. Ironically, while the United States could not sort of uh, build democracy by sending troops, they could build democracy and rule of law by example, leading by example. And a lot of countries follow what the rules were in the United States, follow the educational policy of the United States. So today, not only is it safe to invest in, in, uh, in France, it's safe to invest in Cambodia or in Vietnam. Uh, today, you find sort of high school graduates in, in China and India, and those people compete very aggressively with the uh, US uh, high school graduate. And as a result, uh, that rent was wiped out, while at the top of the distribution, that rent is not only maintained, but is also expanded. Uh, there was, there's a, a huge debate, and Alan has mentioned this this morning, about what are the causes of this inequality. Um, and I wanted to take sort of an example from an area where uh, unions don't play a role, where corporate governance don't play a role, uh, which is actually sport. And, while I have to admit I don't play golf, I think in America it's a popular sport, so what I look is the prizes that uh, people playing golf and winning golf a tournament won over the years. 
And in the United States, the, the, the most prestigious award is the Augusta Master Tournament. And in uh, 1948, the winner of the Augusta Master Tournament was making $5,000. Uh, today, it makes sort of uh, almost $2 million. Now, of course, you have to adjust for inflation. It's still roughly a, a 50 times higher reward. And why is that the case? It's very simple, because in 1948, uh, the winner of the Augusta Master Tournament was not even a professional golfer. It was a golf instructor. And you could walk the day of the tournament and get a ticket. Today, you have to enter a waiting list uh, that opened the last time in 2000, and uh, only a few selected ones get, get a ticket to go. Uh, is probably one of the most watched sport competition in the world with enormous amount of sort of uh, TV rights. And uh, why all this money should go to reward uh, the Tiger Woods of this world? Because after all, they would play there even if they were not paid. They would play there just for the pleasure of winning the Master Tournament. However, the problem, as Alan pointed out this morning, is in a winner-take-all society in a winner-take-all competition, uh, competition compete with other sort of uh, competitions. So the, the Augusta Master Tournament, in order to still attract uh, and uh, detract from other competition in Europe and throughout the world, has to offer higher prices. And the price goes to the highest winner. And so people like at the top of the skill distribution, like Tiger Woods, make uh, a gigantic amount of money and uh, the amount of money drops quite fast afterward. In last time I checked, um, when he was still playing actively before his, his divorce, I think that Tiger Wood was making more than 200 million between prize and endorsements. I think the second golf players was making on the order of uh, 30 million. Uh, the third was not in the list of people making more than 10 million. So uh, you see how fast the, the return to skill drops and how pronounced that inequality is. So uh, globalization uh, and, and, uh, and um, the technology increase this proportion of the return to the winners, like Tiger Woods, and in a sense affected in, an, in a negative way uh, the return of ordinary people. And that really creates a, a big tension in, in the United States today, which is not manifested itself in in social unrest, but I think eventually, in my view, it will, because not only people don't uh, see uh, a chance of succeeding, but also as the game is becoming more winner-take-all, uh, you lose even the hope. Because in a game that is extremely unequal in its outcome, if you start a little bit behind, you're doomed, and your return is very little or none. If the the rewards are more equally distributed. Even if you don't arrive first, you can sort of uh, still run. Uh, but if all the prices to be first and you start a little bit behind, you give up even before you try. And so you have this sense of uh, the market economy that was giving everybody a substantial benefit, that was making everybody richer, is not delivering for the average American as it used to. And uh, the most stunning fact, if you look at compensation of males, for females, the catching up in the labor force improved, but the average male today, the median males today, makes less in real terms than his father. And so if you combine this with the data that Alan was showing, there is very little uh, mobility within uh, you are sort of a generation. There is very little mobility, intergeneration. The system does not seem to deliver sort of a, uh, to society at large. In addition, and in this respect, the financial crisis play a gigantic role, the system appear more and more unfair. And one thing that shocked me, of the many things, but one thing that shocked me in sort of a, uh, coming to the United States from Italy is how much Americans, on average, trust the authorities. As an Italian, you basically distrust the government. Um, and uh, when I first arrived in Boston, I faced sort of a, a tornado warning. 
Now, tornadoes are pretty rare in Italy, and definitely there are no warnings. So I was clearly sort of uh, at uh, the disadvantage trying to, to cope what they were saying. And the order of the mayor at the time was, you have to get into your house, tape all the windows, and stay as far away from the windows as, as sort of uh, possible. And then when I will give a new order, you can come out. And as an Italian, mistrusting Italian, my first reaction was, number one, it must be that the brother of the mayor is selling tape. That's the reason why he sort of uh, advocates that. And two, you do exactly the opposite, because the only way in which you survive in Italy is by doing exactly the opposite of what the government tells you to do. And unfortunately, I got reminded of this in the recent disaster of the Costa Crociere sinking in the uh, Mediterranean Sea. As the boat was taking water on board, the captain told the passengers, everything is fine. Go back to your cabins. Now, Italians, not trusting authority, understood sort of the message. They got their life jacket, and they got to the deck. Uh, few sort of uh, foreign passengers took the captain at his word, went to their cabin, and died. So uh, this is sort of uh, the unfortunate uh, uh, experience that I carry from Italy was to mistrust the authority. When there was a tornado warning, uh, everybody in Boston trusts the authority. And why? Because I think that the idea of a government by the people, of the people, for the people, was not just rhetoric. There was a sense of the government is my representative, is doing uh, what is broadly in my interest. But this, over the years, has disappeared. And I saw with sort of a, a fear what happened during the financial crisis, where not only I, as a mistrusting Italian, was thinking that what Hank Paulson was doing was mostly in the interest of Goldman Sachs, was even the average American saying that. So much so that uh, with a colleague of, at Northwestern, we started a, a, a survey. It's called the Financial Trust Index. And the first time we, we ran it was in December 08. So we asked the question, do you think that uh, Ang Paulson acted in the interest of the American people or in the interest of Goldman Sachs? And 20% of the people did not answer. Of the 80% who answer, half of them said in the interest of Goldman Sachs. And whether this is true or not is to some extent besides the point. Because in politics, perception is as important, sometimes more important than reality. Now, this was not a momentary sort of uh, crisis, because six months later, with the new administration, we sort of asked the question, we sort of modified slightly, we said sort of, uh, do you think that Obama acts in the interest of uh, the American people, the unions, the financial industry? And uh, again, less than half of the people said in the interest of the American people. The only difference is they were divided whether Obama was acting in the interest of the union or the financial industry. But, in either way, it was not act acting in the interest of the American people. And that really undermines sort of uh, the trust in the system that, in my view, has kept together the US market system and the US democracy. And this reminded very much of when my children were small. Um, I have a, a son and a daughter, and they are two years apart. And they were playing or trying to play Monopoly. And my son is two years older, so they, they would try to play. And shortly after the beginning, uh, my daughter will always start crying like crazy. So I had to intervene, try to figure out what, what happened. And sort of uh, uh, my daughter would say that, that uh, her brother was cheating. And, and my son, with the rules in his hands, would say, no, no, I'm following the rules. And no, he wasn't lying. He was selectively remembering and enforcing the rules. Uh, because at the time, my daughter could not read very well. He, he did. So he knew all the rules and, of course, remembered the rules only when it was in his favor. And, and my daughter would do the only reasonable thing to do in that situation, which is to scream and leave the game. And I feel that's very much what an increasing fraction of the American people is doing nowadays. They are feeling that the game is rigged against them, that they have no chance of winning. And as a result, they sort of uh, 
uh, leave the game and scream. And they scream in very different forms. Uh, they can scream uh, with the Occupy uh, movement, or they can scream with a Tea Party. Uh, they seem at the opposite end of the political spectrum, but in fact, they are quite similar. They see the enemy on a different phase, but they don't realize the common enemy. In a sense, the, the Tea Party see the element as an overly powerful and intrusive government. Um, and uh, the Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, movement see that as an overly powerful and intrusive big business. And they don't understand that those are two faces of the same Leviathan, is the intermingling between big business and big government that creates the problem. And I think that given the situation, uh, some form of populism in the United States and throughout the world are today inevitable. The question is not if, is which kind of populism. And unfortunately, since I've written the book, uh, Europe is getting more than its fair share of populism, from sort of the extreme parties in, uh, in Greece to the Five Star Movement in Italy to the rising uh, to basically first party of the Le Pen movement in France, and so on and so forth. In the United States, this has not received yet uh, a common sort of uh, platform, but I think that the, the serious danger of that exists. And so given this, I asked myself the question, what can we do to uh, improve the situation? And my answer is a paradoxical answer, it's saying, why don't, instead of trying to fight this populace, don't we try to channel its right, its right sort of uh, request into a, not a way to destroy the free market system, but to make it better? Why don't we try to use it to fight the crony part of capitalists and not capitalists itself? And I think that uh, this is something that my come as completely crazy for a European is less crazy seen from the perspective of an American. And it says, the word populist in much of the world is a four-letter word because populist is generally associated with extreme, crazy, right-wing or left-wing parties that brought disaster to every country where they prevail. As I was saying earlier, in the United States, they, they have their fair share of crazy populists as well, and since they're not exempted from that, but they also have experiences of more populist party, like the People's Party, that had less radical platform that achieve uh, in rebalancing the economic and political power uh, in the country. And so uh, my sort of uh, goal here is to try to create a platform uh, on how you can improve the system rather than kill it, uh, given what we have at the moment. And so what I want to spend the, the remaining sort of uh, time I have in my disposition in trying to outline what type of recipe I advocate. First of all, I want to tell you what type of recipe I will not use, and it is sort of a massive uh, tax redistribution. And not because I think that uh, uh, we cannot do more with taxes. I think that the recent tax reform uh, was uh, uh, way overdue so, uh, in the United States. So I don't, I don't have any problem in raising taxes. But the real problem is that if you're trying to fix the problem only with taxes, you're not going to get out of that. And if you make income redistribution the target, uh, you don't know where you end up, and this will favor the most extremist and anti-capitalist form of populism that I think will not lead in the right direction. So what I would try to do is try to fight cronies with market forces to the extent it's possible, and no market forces where that is not possible. So the first force, which I think plays some role today, but I want to reinforce, is actually the force of ideas. Uh, as economists, we tend to think that only sort of uh, self-interest will prevail and uh, ideas don't play a big role. But actually, uh, even at Chicago, 
uh, Bob Fogo, uh, who passed away unfortunately recently, was a big advocate of the power of ideas. In his book, Time on the Cross, he said, slavery in the United States was not abolished because it was economically unprofitable, it was abolished because it was morally wrong. And there was enough sort of a strong will of people to assert that, that change the system. So I think it's very important that we make a clear distinction between an agenda that is pro-market, an agenda that I very much endorse, and an agenda that is pro-business. In the political environment, even in Washington, those two terms are often used interchangeably. In fact, the pro-business is used more than the pro-market. And while businessmen very often are in favor of sort of uh, better markets, very often are not, because a businessman wants a free market when he wants to enter a new industry. Once it is in this industry, wants higher barriers to entry to make more profit. And that's exactly where the agenda of pro-market and pro-business conflict. And sort of uh, my view of uh, a good policy is actually what I have observed uh, paradoxically in the Grand Canyon in the United States. When, when I went there for the first time, I was stunned not only by the natural beauty, but also by a note that was saying, please don't feed the wild animals. And underneath, the United States are very good at writing everything, explaining everything. Underneath, they say, because if you feed the wild animals uh, human food, they lose their ability to gather food in the wilderness. And long term, you're actually hurting their survivor rather than helping them. So the act of donating food might be seen as a charitable act uh, an animalist act, in fact, is an act against the interests of the animals themselves. Now, clearly, if we were in a hypothetical animal farming, which they decide the rules, they will put like a very nice post, say, please give us a lot of food and not the crappy McDonald's, but something better and blah, 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 blah. But they're not in charge of the uh, national parks because humans are. I would like to transpose this idea to Washington or whatever capital you choose to pick. I would like to put under Capitol Hill a sort of same note saying, please don't feed business. Precisely because I love business, I don't want the government to subsidize it, given privileges, and so on and so forth. Because every privilege eventually will make the business less competitive and less able to survive in the long term. Any form of monopoly or advantage given by the government, long term, turns against the very organizations that are receiving it. Competition is the best disinfectant against the corruption of capitalism. Uh, I became even more unpopular than I am in Italy by saying that it's not a coincidence that nepotism was invented in Rome in the Catholic Church. And you know, nepotism is an euphemism because the popes at the time, uh, I love the new popes, but at the time, the popes were sort of placing their children, they couldn't have children officially, but in practice they did, place their children, so they're called nephews, in important position. Now, why the Catholic Church could afford to do that? Because it had a monopoly power and did not fear of disappearing as a result of competition. If you are trying to uh, sort of worship God in a different way, even within the Christian sort of uh, uh, paradigm, but in a different way, you were burned alive like Giordano Bruno was in Campo dei Fiori. And so it was extremely dangerous. This is the ultimate form of monopoly enforced by the state authority. As a result, popes and high sort of a uh, member of the church could appoint family and friends in important position in spite of their incompetence and still hope that the church will be there years to, to come. This is not true in the United States. 
One of the great things about all the values Protestant church, including also the Catholic Church in the States, is they are competing very actively. So you cannot appoint a minister or a treasurer of a parish who is an idiot because the church will literally disappear. And the result is now move forward 500 years or 400 years, and what you find out that there is more religiosity in the United States than in Italy. Why? Because in the long term, the very monopoly that the church got through the use of the power of the state retorted against the church itself and against sort of its continuation long term. So I think that if you are really pro-market, you fight more aggressively than anybody else all the distortions and the benefits that business receive from the government because when you start to compete in that direction, is a slippery slope is very difficult to get out of. If I understand that my comparative advantage is in lobbying in Washington or in Rome or in whatever capital you want to think of, then the kind of entrepreneurs that will lead business would be different. Because it would not be the most innovative, it would not be the, it would just be the most connected. And this creates sort of a, a competition in the wrong direction that leads to the destruction of the country. And I think Italy stands out there as an example of how bad it can be. Greece is similar. And the United States, fortunately, are not uh, uh, at that level, but they are farther along in that, in that dimension. So I think that uh, it's very important to uh, uh, enhance this agenda. Now, how do you practically implement that? I think that, again, the power of idea is extremely valuable in lobbying. And all too often, we economists, directly or indirectly, help the lobbying by advocating this or this other position. Uh, let me make an example. I think that Fannie and Freddie and all the disasters would not be been possible if they didn't have behind a great idea. Give a house to every American. How can you fight against this idea? Uh, if you say openly, we need to redistribute more money to the financial industry uh, and to a few Congress people, uh, that will not fly very much and will be difficult to implement it. But with the nice idea of giving a, a house to every American, uh, the major disasters could be made. So my proposal is to turn, to limit economic policy only to taxes rather than to subsidies. As economists, we know that there is a, almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between sort of subsidizing something and, and taxing the, 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 uh, the subsidy of good. Now, what is the difference between the two? The difference is that, of course, the redistributional effect of the two are dramatically different. The reason why people uh, lobby for sort of a tax deductibility of uh, uh, mortgages, for example, is only in minor uh, element to increase the amount of home ownership is because this creates a huge redistribution in favor of the mortgage industry and the real estate industry and so on and so forth. So if you force them to enact the legislation through taxes, you will make it extremely difficult for any self-serve legislation to pass. Because imagine how sellable from a political point of view would be the idea we want to enhance sort of uh, home ownership in America. That's the reason why we tax every renter. After all, that's what we do implicitly. When we subsidize mortgage deduction, what we end up doing is taxing people to rent. However, this is indirect. People don't see it. And as a result, Congress people find it very easy to sell the mortgage deduction as an example of good policy. If you are forcing them to tax sort of uh, uh, the, uh, the renter, it will never have that, that policy. Now, is this preemptive, preempting any kind of policy? No, because we do have a taxation on cigarettes because they create a, a negative externality. And in some countries, we do have, and there are some proposals, to, we do have to tax CO2 emissions. That's sort of a, a much better way to deal with these problems. Uh, and 
By the way, they have also a nice side effect that they increase also revenues that uh, they are in short supplies these days, so it's not a bad idea. The second way to sort of try to uh, change this agenda is to enhance competition in a lot of sectors. Uh, much of the inequality in the income distribution, paradoxically, is due to lack of competition. And let me make two examples. Number one, we talk about executive compensation. Alan, this morning, said not only executive compensation are excessive, but they're also unjust because he mentioned a, a very important paper by uh, Mulanathan and, and Bertrand, because they, they observe that CEOs are rewarded for luck, like um, increasing oil prices. What he did not mention is that that's generally the case when there is bad governance, when shareholders are not represented properly on the board, when the board are captured by the CEOs that basically we appoint them. So one thing we need to do is actually fight against regulation meant to preempt it or prevent shareholders to express their representative on board of US companies. The election of US boards is the closest thing to a Soviet election in Western economies. You have incumbents present a slate of uh, candidate, only one slate, and you can vote yes or withhold your vote. Even if you withhold your vote, even if you receive a minority of votes, the directors are elected anyway. There is no way to get rid of them. There is no way to actually appoint somebody who represents the shareholders directly. Why is that the case? SEC regulation preempt this. Why the excuse is because during the Vietnam War, you didn't want sort of an agitator to sort of create problems. But you know, it's a little bit like in Japan, in which companies pay the Yakuza, which is the local mafia, to create turmoils at shareholders' meeting so that basically incumbent management could, could do whatever they want. And th this system is prevailing also in the United States. And uh, they use sort of the fantasy of uh, social revolution in order to preempt the most capitalist of all revolution, shareholders on the board. Now, for a sort of a irony of of the situation, Italy that has so many screwed up institutions has one institution that work half okay, which is have some position on the board uh, that are reserved to candidates by institutional investors. And I have the privilege of serving uh, in one of those positions, and I can tell you that I can look the CEO in the face and say, you're paid too much, or I want to restructure your compensation based on relative pay, and still be on the board at the next shareholders meeting, uh, which is not the case for most US director, and that's the reason why they're not so aggressive in sort of fighting the excessive of shareholder compensation. So the first rule to reduce inequality is to increase competition where competition is preempted by regulation. And by the way, uh, I later will criticize the Dodd-Frank law for many things, but in this, the Dodd-Frank law got it right uh, allow the SEC to introduce a rule. This rule was stopped by the business round table on the basis that not enough cost-benefit analysis was done, and the SEC decided to shelve the proposal so nothing will come out of this. Speaking that the good rules, the good, ru uh, good rules, even when approved by Congress, they are never implemented, while the bad rules are imp implemented right away. Uh, but I can continue uh, with examples. Alan was talking uh, this morning about sort of uh, uh, doctors in the United States, or we were talking also last night, doctors in the United States pay, being paid much more than in other countries. Why? Because they are one of the most effective lobby and pre in preventing entry from other countries. And, uh, uh, and in the same way, the cost of healthcare in the United States is extremely large, in part because the doctors are expensive, in part is because the drug industry has sort of uh, co-opted all the uh, administration, one after the other, 
uh, is second only to the finance industry in terms of uh, lobbying money and is probably at the same level in terms of influence, so much so that you can buy sort of medicines from Canada uh, that cost like a fraction of what they cost in the United States. Why? Because this was the condition that allowed the healthcare reform to go through. The Obama administration had to uh, sort of buy into the drug industry in order not to have the opposition. With the opposition of the drug industry, nothing would have taken place in the United States uh, in terms of, uh, of reform. So I think that that's an, a, an example of this distortion. And the same is true in finance. Part of the reason why finance salaries are so large is because uh, some markets are not very transparent and, compa uh, and competitive. Uh, the derivative market, uh, except the one, uh, I'm not just uh, defending Chicago, but except the one that traded on the Chicago Board of Trade or the Chicago Mechanical Exchange, they tend to be very opaque with high margin, and much of the money that uh, the uh, finance people make is in that segment, which is not very uh, competitive, and that's, that's a problem. And the second part of the agenda of competition is also to give hope to the people who don't. As I said, uh, the, a system based on winner-take-all creates enormous disincentive for people to participate. So the equality of starting points becomes more important today than it was in the past. And while the perfect equality is an utopia we will never reach, we are so far off that mark that there is a lot of work to be done in that direction, starting with better schools for uh, everybody. And one of the obstacles to this uh, better school are, or is, the teacher union that is sort of uh, making difficult to introduce sort of meritocracy into uh, the school system in the United States. But just to make sure that I don't criticize also only the other, I think that the university industry in the United States has a big sort of uh, responsibility because it is beneficiary of gigantic subsidy from the government. Uh, most kids at age 18 don't know how to make investment decision. And here you have a bunch of colleges that say education is priceless, so you can pay any price. And by the way, the government gives you a loan for whatever amount you want, basically, and uh, the, the, the school is not concerned about repayment because it's insured by the government. Uh, the kid uh, is, is trusting the college educator and the government to give them good advice, but they are conflicted, and as a result, they end up spending a huge amount of money in colleges that don't have the return to investment. The, the next big debt crisis in the United States will be the college debt crisis. It will be even more severe than the mortgage crisis. But the third sort of uh, uh, element to try to reduce the power of lobbying is uh, a more diffuse availability of actual data. Why do I say that? I think that most people are not involved in public policy. Most people are not interested in reading the details of financial regulation or the drug industry regulation. However, the media industry and the academic industry can play a gigantic role in analyzing and translating information at the level uh, of the ordinary voters and change and pressure ordinary voters to make a difference. Let me make an example because I don't remember whether it was Martin Wolf or somebody else from the FT in commenting my book said, oh, uh, it's, it's full of good recipe, but are basically recipe of Taki who has to vote for Thanksgiving or Christmas, depending on the country you are, and they will never do that. And it's true. I think that many of my recipes require Takis to vote for Thanksgiving. However, if you decide to have a feast before Thanksgiving, Turkeys are very happy to vote to be killed only at Thanksgiving. And uh, w let me make an example. It says, until two years ago, uh, in the United States, Congress or Congress people could use information about regulation that was coming from their job to trade in the stock market, and that was not considered insider trading. 
So if I am a member of the Health Commission and I know that all of a sudden we're going to reimburse uh, uh, eyeglasses to everybody, I can buy shares of an eyeglass company the day before and sell it the day after, make a nice profit, and not be sort of uh, accused of any wrongdoing. And for years, a few good Congress people tried to make legislation to change this, and of course, will not receive more than two or three uh, signatures. Then, two years ago, things changed overnight. Why? Because a researcher wrote a book documenting all the trades done by all the Congress people. And if there is one thing that is bipartisan in Washington, is both sides use massively these benefits uh, in every possible form or shape. <laughs> now, why this book could be written? Because there was a mandatory disclosure. Now, this disclosure, you had to go in Washington and read through archives, was not easily accessible, but at least was available. Now, why this book was written? Probably because the guy wanted to become famous or make money. But the combination of availability of data and profit motive made people inform. And as a result of that book and a 60 Minutes program that was run shortly afterward, both Congress and the Senate vote a law in a week, and the president signed it right away. So changes can take place if there is enough popular support for it. How do you get popular support? By pointing out the problems and explaining to ordinary human beings. Um, the issue about sort of uh, trying as an economist to act for change, the research you do has sooner or later an impact on some legislation, and most of the time has a bad impact because it's used to lobby in the wrong direction, and you should be aware of that when you do research and, and when you write because that, those are the consequences of what you do. And so it's very important that you have availability of data and competition because that allows sort of uh, the media industry and the academic industry to act as a watchdog for the government and the business interests. And that watchdog that is mostly motivated by fame and profits, but there's nothing wrong to be motivated by profit. Uh, this is what Adam Smith said a long time ago. I think that leads to a better outcome. But this better outcome is only available if you let the data be accessible to everybody. Now, a lot of government agencies keep data secret, or even worse, they give data only to a selected few. And surprise, surprise, most of the papers of the selected few support the views of the people holding the data. And I have a colleague who wrote a, an article uh, about this, the comparison between the Fed and the state regulators, and they have uh, some banks that alternate between the two, and he compares the rating of the two. These ratings are secret, and uh, <clears throat> you know there are reasons why you don't want to release them immediately, because you they create, might create some instability. But there's no reason for a delay to prevent a delay disclosure, because uh, if there is a delay disclosure of three or four years, everybody can study and everybody can see the difference. My colleague who got access to that through a, a, a co-author who is at the Fed found that the state regulators are much worse than the Fed and sort of uh, particularly so when the bank is large vis-a-vis -vis the state regulator in terms of size. And the reaction of the Fed is we cannot release this data anymore. Why? Because expose problems. And the best way to maintain power is to keep the data confidential. So I think that uh, uh, one recipe against sort of capture and against regulatory capture is to expose all the data possible, because that's a way to test whether well-intended regulation ends up sort of hurting rather than uh, helping uh, the people uh, this is designed for. And in this period, I think it's extremely important to keep things simple. Uh, even at the cost, and this is sort of a, with some regret being an economist, even the cost of some economic inefficiency. 
Why? As economists, we love sort of complicated schemes. But complicated schemes are extremely difficult to implement, extremely difficult to enforce, and also extremely difficult to explain to ordinary human beings who are, most of the time, absent or not particularly engaged. And as a result, when you get into complicated stuff, the power of the lobbyists go to the roof. I found on the inter internet a former regulator who does admit that he used to write regulation in a complicated way on purpose, so to create loopholes for the industry. And to me, this sounds very familiar, uh, because in Italy, in the old days, the, the law was still written in Latin. Why? Because only the lawyers really understood what was written in it, and they shaped the law to the interests of the powerful people who were running the country. So the ordinary people could not get justice ever. So uh, in the United States, law and regulation is not written in a foreign language, but is even almost worse to some extent. It's written in legalese, and it's very hard to, to, to understand. And that's the reason why I came to conclude that a simple Glass-Steagall rule was much better than a complicated Volcker rule, uh, in part because the Volcker rule is so complicated that it will never be properly in, in implemented. Uh, you know, the difference between sort of a legal trade, proprietary trade, and not proprietary trade is the intention of the trader. You, we have to hire Ernst Fair and his fMRI to figure out in what part of the brain the intention is and subject every trader to fMRI for every trade to determine what was the intention of the trade. I think, uh, with all due respect for Alan, who contributed to uh, sort of uh, his approval, but I think that the, the reason why the Volcker rule was adopted is because Volcker is a very respected man, and so had a political appeal, and the industry knew that was not implementable. So from the point of view of the Obama administration, you got the support of the people, you got the support of the industry, what do you want more? Now, let me finish with one thing which I think is, is important and was discussed here, and is the importance, and, and I think Casper said very nicely in the previous debate, the importance of social norms for the functioning of the market economy. I think that we economists are responsible not only to have ignore, by and large, the importance of the social norm for a long period of time, but also, to some extent, to have undermined their functioning. So let me explain very briefly. I think that in many simple market transactions, some social norms helps in making these markets more efficient. And we economists tend to not only ignore them, but to teach in a way that tend to undermine those norms. So you all know uh, about my famous colleague Gary Becker and his theory of crime. His theory of crime is, is really a, a very brilliant theory developed in 1968, so many, many years ago, in which you sort of look at uh, crime as an economic decision. You commit a crime if the expected benefit is bigger than the expected cost, where the expected cost is the probability of being caught times the penalty that you receive if you're caught. So this is a very useful tool to analyze uh, many decisions. It's not useful to analyze if you kill your wife because you're jealous, but it's generally useful for white collar crime and so on and so forth. However, many people, and, and, and Gary Becker is not liable of that, but many people teach this as saying it is rational to commit a crime if the expected benefit is bigger than the expected cost, which almost translates into it is irrational not to commit a crime when the expected benefit is bigger than the expected cost. And while rational and irrational, in principle, they should be just sort of uh, positive terms, they do carry a normative element to it. Nobody really wants to show up, I am the irrational person. Uh, so in doing that, we, I think, undermine the very norms that help sustaining the market economy. And I think that we professors at business school, we have a particular responsibility in trying to enhance those norms. Why? Because the survival, long-term survival on the efficient market economy is really in our long-term interest. 
no business, as I said, as an interest in sort of lobbying for the functioning of the market overall. But we teachers of business school do have that interest because I have to say, if the US economy deteriorates into a chronic capitalist system, uh, there's no room for business school. In Italy, people don't go to business school. They go to Rome and they, they get to know politicians or maybe even sleep with them. That's the way to richness, is not to go to business school. So we have an interest in supporting those norms and sort of, uh, especially if we don't believe very much in regulation, social norms are an alternative. It's not a perfect substitute. We do need regulation, even the presence of social norms. But social norms have a big advantage with the regulation is by definition, they cannot be captured because social norms uh, are enforced by social stigma. And so basically informed by a, a broad uh, consensus so it's very hard to enforce social norms that favor the few at the expense of the many. Uh, it's very difficult to enforce social norms that say that you should give more money to executives or uh, give, uh, protect the, the drug industry so that it has large profits and so on and so forth. So social norms has this big advantage. And that, let me terminate, because I see that I'm over time, I want to terminate with, with one little reminder. Uh, my, my book is called A Capitalist for the People because I was always struck by uh, the Gettysburg Address by uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, that terminates saying that uh, that people uh, die so that a government of the people, by the people, for the people should not perish from the uh, face of Earth. And tomorrow exactly happens to be the 150th anniversary of that address, which is one of the most beautiful pieces of rhetoric, but is also a symbol of what a democracy should be, and in my view, also of what a uh, economic system should be. So I would like that a capitalist by the people, of the people, for the people, shall not perish from the faith of earth. Thank you. So I would like to thank uh, Luigi for this uh, uh, very exciting uh, lecture. And uh, uh, we have uh, l some limited time for Q&A. And Alan is uh, first. Uh, thank you for that uh, <clears throat> very fascinating talk. Uh, I have to say, uh, sitting here, I would say that the issues are more complicated. <laughs> some of what you described rang very true to me, some of which uh, struck me as quite foreign, so I thought it might be useful if I took a couple of minutes just to explain. Uh, one thing which does ring true is there are certainly forces to prevent competition. And it's the classic economic problem where the benefits of competition are diffuse uh, and the benefits of preventing competition are concentrated. One of the unique features of the office that I held is I was the only member of the cabinet without a constituency. The agriculture secretary is bound to help the agricultural industry. Commerce department has to help certain industries, labor, and so on. Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors was set up to support a more efficient, more equal uh, country. In, this, in, the, in the authorizing legislation, it actually specifically says to defend free markets. Uh, so I think that might be a good example for other countries uh, to follow, and I think it also explains why I was often the only voice at the table advocating for certain positions. Uh, there's one fascinating area I would suggest that you follow closely. That's the development of natural gas in the United States. Uh, we have this tremendous bounty. It's really a sign of our country working the way it's supposed to. Uh, innovation partly supported by government research, entrepreneurs investing, the financial system actually directing resources uh, to something which is more productive. Um, and uh, it has tremendous potential to change uh, our economy and also geostrategic relationships. Uh, the petrochemical industry views this input as a nice cheap input. They wouldn't mind preventing it from being exported. Um, companies which make a lot of money exporting goods themselves have made arguments 
why they should restrict exporting liquefied natural gas, um, the economic logic strikes me as quite strained. Now, how that plays out, my guess is that we will end up going towards uh, exports of natural gas. So that, that's an example uh, where competition will probably win out. Uh, I think that you're right that the revolving door is an issue. I'll challenge you to identify one Secretary of State who went to work for a particular company uh, where uh, there was uh, some interest in what that person did. Uh, most Secretary of States have more lofty roles after they leave. You should have used the Defense Secretary as an example. <laughs> uh, if I were to write a book on saving capitalism uh, from capitalists, I would have focused on a different Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and the role of Social Security. Um, and when we went through a crisis in the 1930s, as you know, uh, the emergency programs that Roosevelt implemented fundamentally changed the American system of capitalism, I think for the better, uh, and I think it's one of uh, uh, the, uh, the reforms that has led to more widespread support for our system uh, of government and our system of capitalism. Um, and in a, in a way, I think if you think about what's going on in Washington today, in some sense, the only institution that held up against the financial crisis was the government. And I think one of the reasons why you saw the government expand uh, was because it became clear that it was only the government that could rescue the economy from capitalism at that point uh, when, when we were imploding. Um, I think the situation with business is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the business roundtable, which you cited, supported the president's proposal for a grand bargain, supported Bowles Simpson, got absolutely nowhere. Uh, you see the Chamber of Commerce now threatening that it's not going to support Republican candidates because it didn't get very sensible things that what it wanted uh, regarding the shutdown and, and raising the debt ceiling. Uh, so that's a situation where I think it's more nuanced. Uh, also, when it comes to competition, the Affordable Care Act sets up these exchanges where the idea was to have more competition among the insurance companies. And it looks like the rates that they submitted were lower in areas where there was more competition. So I think that's an example where the government actually fostered competition. Uh, the situation on the Disclose Act is much more complicated and worse than you think. So this has to do with the insider trading. Uh, Congress acted very quickly. It ver acted very quickly to put restrictions on insider trading on the White House, not on itself. Now, the, the White House already had restrictions. It made us uh, disclose more uh, uh, information about transactions, some of which is actually quite dangerous because it could reveal uh, agents abroad and so on, uh, but Congress didn't solve the problem at all. So I think this is an example uh, where Congress acted and then the public kind of went back to sleep. And it makes me worried about your idea that uh, research would be a disinfectant for crony capitalism. And it makes me worried about it in a few respects. First of all, there's a good deal of research which is supported by industry, as you know. Uh, in areas where research is complicated and nuanced, the volume probably matters. So I faced this when I did work on the minimum wage, and low-wage employers formed front groups. They wouldn't disclose who contributed to these groups. These groups paid millions of dollars supporting academics to write studies, uh, most of which uh, got rejected by journals. Uh, and uh, from the public's perspective, they don't know the difference between serious work and non-serious work. So I think it's a far more difficult uh, situation than, uh, than it appears. Um, likewise, when it comes to proprietary schools and, and exploiting government financing, I think that is a serious issue. I doubt that we'll have a bubble nearly as severe as what we saw in the housing market, so I think I'll just call that hyperbole. But again, the situation is more complicated because Congress actually did authorize the administration to promulgate regulations preventing um, uh, the, the schools from, uh, or at least uh, putting some mild restrictions on the schools uh, that exploited students. Um, <clears throat> the uh, schools, acting in their self-interest, lobbied the courts, and the courts overturned it, and we're back to the drawing board. But there actually was uh, some small bit of progress. Uh, then the last thing I was going to say, and this is also one of those examples where it's more complicated, Abraham Lincoln, one of my heroes, one of your heroes, you would have also called him a crony capitalist. Uh, Lincoln, uh, as you know, and it's, you can see it in the movie if you watch the movie Lincoln, uh, also got his hands dirty in politics. I think that's the nature of our system. And I think it's one of those areas where it's, it, it's um, just better than the rest. It certainly has all its flaws. Um, so um, uh, I, I just thought I'd 
uh, end by highlighting that we have to take the good with the bad. Thank you, Alan. I, I can take another uh, much shorter question. <laughs> and uh, otherwise, I, I'll give the floor uh, straight to Luigi for a short reply, because we have all the dinner tonight to, to sort all these important issues. So if there are, uh, no other question. Uh, so it, oh, there is another uh, question. Yes. Let's go. Thank you very much for your uh, refreshing speech. I would like to ask you two questions. The first one is uh, uh, you were uh, involved in the Board of Directors of Telecom Italia, and I would like to ask you the reasons why you took over this, uh, this job and the lessons learned. And the second question is about... So, so can you repeat the question? I was involved in this. No, no, in the board of directors oh. of Telecom Italia. Ah, yes, yeah. Oh, okay. Telecom Italia. Mm -hmm. And the second question is that uh, you also made a stint tinted in uh, Italian politics. And uh, could you also please tell us what uh, lessons you learned there? Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, let's start with uh, sort of Alan's question, which are easier. Uh, so the, fir <laughs> the, the first one, example of a Secretary of State who took a job that uh, benefited, very easy, uh, Rubin. Uh, Robert Rubin was uh, at the Treasury, uh, contributed to the repeal of Glass-Steagall uh, that was instrumental for Citigroup to perform the merger. Um, and uh, the one month after he resigned, he was hired by Citigroup uh, for a non-executive position at more than 10 million a year. Uh, so, Robert Rubin? Sorry, sorry, the treasure. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, sorry, the treasure. Of course. Uh, no, no, no. no it, it's relevant because Secretary of State would not have uh, had any power on that. The Secretary of Treasury did have power on that. And by the way, Robert Rubin did lobby uh, the Bush administration to save Enron. I think that the only decision that the Bush administration did right was not to save Enron in face of uh, the financial disaster. And uh, of course, Citigroup lost a lot of money in the process. And Robert Rubin was first in line lobbying sort of uh, the uh, Bush administration uh, not to uh, let them fail. Uh, and of course, also Citigroup was treated particularly nicely uh, during the financial crisis. Maybe that's a coincidence, maybe not. So I think that that's, that's clearly, uh, for me, it's a, it's a negative example. But what is all, even more negative is that Robert Rubin pay no reputational penalty for his behavior. Is today considered still a uh, great, great old man and respected and, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think that uh, uh, people should pay a price for that. Um, in terms of... Uh, uh, the welfare system, absolutely. I think that uh, uh, I do believe that the welfare system is crucial in uh, uh, supporting a free market economy. Uh, in the book with Raghu, we said uh, at the very minimum, because without a welfare system, uh, the capitalists will use workers as a human shield. And in Italy, we see all the time uh, in uh, even... Uh, the people in Taranto that are polluting the entire sort of uh, uh, area are using the workers as an excuse to keep polluting. Uh, so if you don't have a good uh, uh, unemployment insurance, the one that Tito was describing today, uh, then there is this uh, misuse. But in, in this book, I add another element, at least equally important, is as the economy becomes more and more a winner-take-all, uh, people will face a huge amount of risk. And while you can be more risk neutral, less risk averse in financial markets where you can diversify, if there is one sector where you cannot diversify, is your life. You have only one life, uh, unless you believe in reincarnation. And so you put all your eggs in, in one basket, and if the payoff is very asymmetric, you took a lot of risk. You take a lot of risk. So either people will not try, they will give up trying, or you need to provide a safety net on the sort of uh, uh, on the low level. So I'm absolutely uh, with him regarding the importance of a welfare system on this. On, on the two questions on, on Italy, the first one on Telecom Italia, I think that uh, has been an extremely useful uh, experience, at least as a personal level, of uh, how sort of uh, not to run a, com a company. Uh, 
uh, and what is wrong with the Italian uh, corporate system. So I think that I uh, have a lot of uh, f first direct experience before it was purely academic. Now I have also the practical experience. Um, in terms of, uh, of my uh, short political experience, uh, for those of you who don't know, I help contribute founding a party that uh, was sort of a free market party in Italy. Uh, and uh, I realize how sort of not uh, made for politics I am, uh, because maybe I'm not willing to compromise or hide. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, it might be true that even Lincoln was playing sort of dirty deals. Uh, but you know, I, I do believe in Machiavelli, but I do believe in the right interpretation of Machiavelli. So uh, a lot of people think that Machiavelli said that uh, 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 the end justified the means. No, it just certain particular ends justify certain particular means. So if the end is end is slavery, even uh, ending out a few corrupted jobs is acceptable. If your end is trying to get yourself elected into a position, lying is something that I don't uh, recognize and endorse. And that's sort of uh, what caused my withdrawal from Italian politics for uh, my, the, the rest of my life. Thank you. Thank you.